Welcome to section 15.3, where we're going to discuss some of the ways that evolution occurs and some of the ways evolution doesn't occur. So to start off with, I just want to make sure we're very clear with a couple points about evolution and natural selection. The first is an individual cannot evolve. When we talk about evolution, evolution involves genes changing over time. Genes and the alleles for those genes are what ultimately is evolution. Now, for genes to change over time, you need to go through and have offspring. And by having offspring, that's when you can start to notice these changes. That's where certain traits, certain alleles, certain genes can become more common than others because they're better for that particular environment. So whenever we talk about evolution, it has to be about a population, or you could in some cases use a species as a whole, but it's got to be a group of organisms. It cannot be an individual. Now, an individual can be selected, meaning an individual, based on its genetic traits, can be more likely to live and reproduce and therefore pass on its trait, making it more common in the future. But it cannot evolve. It's the offspring, it's the next generation being more like that individual that was selected that is the evolution itself. Now, starting out when we're discussing evolution, the first thing I want to do is really go over this Hardy-Weinberg principle, which is the idea of how we can analyze genetics of a population, assuming that that population is not evolving. Now, this can seem weird because to have a population in genetic equilibrium, which means not evolving, you have to have a bunch of conditions we'll talk about coming up that are never going to happen. But this equation will still work to give us information about a population as like a snapshot, as it is right now. It won't last. If we were in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, whatever we got as an answer for this particular equation would stay valid forever. Because we don't have actual Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, whatever we get as answers will be valid essentially for right now. But as soon as we get to the next generation, or in some cases in a volatile environment, maybe even the next day, these numbers could start to change. But they still help us see evolution in action. We just have to do this multiple times over the course of months or years or decades so we can see how the genetics are changing. Because that change in genetics is evolution. This change in the frequency of genes or alleles is how evolution happens. So let's first go through and describe the parts of this equation. Now I'm going to write off to the side here this other part that you kind of need to know, and that's P plus Q equals 1. Now P is going to be the incident of the dominant allele. So this is the frequency of the dominant allele. It's how common the dominant allele is. This is not a genotype. I'm not talking about the frequency of dominant individuals phenotypically. I'm saying if I take all the alleles in that population, two per person, and I kind of put them all in one big box, and I picked out one allele at random, what are the odds that allele is a dominant allele? This will typically be, you know, 80%, 90%, 60, 50, 40, something like that. I normally keep it a whole number to make it easy. Now, we're normally going to use this in decimal form. So if it was 60%, for instance, that was dominant, we would write 0.6 here. Now, Q is then going to be the recessive allele frequency. Now, because we need to have 100% alleles total, because we always assume that there's only two alleles possible, that's where this works, then that means that whatever wasn't the dominant allele must be the recessive allele. So if 60% of the alleles are ultimately dominant, that means that 40% or 0.4 of the alleles must be recessive. And that gets us to our total of 1. Now that we know P and Q, we can start to discuss the bottom part, the, the core of the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. And this bottom part is going to be discussing genotypes. That's really what we're looking at here. So these are the genotypes which will determine the phenotypes of the organisms of that type in that area. So P squared means that you have two P alleles. So this would essentially be homozygous dominant. If you have a P and a Q, you're going to be heterozygous. And if you have Q squared, you have two Qs, two recessive alleles, so that's going to then be homozygous recessive. So phenotypically, all the guys over on the left-hand side, the P squareds and the two PQs, these guys will be dominant phenotypically. They'll look dominant. Whereas these homozygous recessives will be the only ones that actually look recessive phenotypically. So we can then do calculations. So you need to memorize that P squared is homozygous dominant. You need to memorize that 2PQ is how we calculate the heterozygotes. And you need to memorize that Q squared is the homozygous recessive. If you're confused as to why this is a 2 here, I'll just give you a quick heads up. 
If we do the Punnett square, if you guys remember, for two heterozygotes mating, big T, little t, big T, little t, remember there's one chance we get big T, big T. There's only one way this can happen. So that's ultimately P squared, right? This is a dominant. There's one way we can get homozygous recessive. There we go. But there's actually two different ways that we can become heterozygous. You can have where essentially this parent, let's assume that it's the father, can give the big T and the mother gives the little t, or the mother could give the big T and the father could give the little t. So because there's two different ways for it to happen, we have to multiply that value by two. So there is a, a rationale for why this equation is what it is. It's not just kind of pulled out of somebody's orifice. So let's go through some actual problems so you can see how we use this. So the first problem, I'm going to give you an allele frequency. Whenever I say allele frequency, you better realize I'm talking about one of two guys, P or Q. Those are the alleles. They're not genotypes, they're alleles. So at this point, if it's the dominant allele, that's going to be P. So P equals 0.6. At this point, you can realize, well, then Q must be 0.4, because just like we did in the last slide, you can realize they have to add up to 1. Once we know P and Q, we can solve for anything else because p squared, 2pq, q squared, they all just involve p's and q's. So if they ask me for the frequency of heterozygotes, I have to say, all right, which one's the heterozygotes? In this case, it's 2pq. So I need to say that I'm going to take 2 times p, which is 0.6, times q, which is 0.4, and so my answer would be 0.48, or 48% of that population would be heterozygous. If instead I'd asked you something like how many of them are homozygous recessive, you would say, well, that would be Q squared. So then I'd go through and I'd take Q, which is 0.4, and I'd square it. So that's going to give me 0.16. If I felt like it, I could say how many are homozygous dominant, and you could go through and say that's P squared then, so 0.6 squared, so it should be 0.36. And if you want to check yourself, you can say, well, all these things together should add up to 1. So 0.48 plus 0.16, plus 0.36, these are all my genotypes. They're kind of out of order. This is heterozygotes, this is homozygous recessive, this is homozygous dominant, but they should all add up to one, and sure enough, they do. So it looks like I've done things right. In this case, seeing as I just asked for heterozygotes, we can just put that down. So that's one way to solve it. Now the other thing I can do that's more common in reality is you have somebody sit out there and count an organism to try to figure out how many of the organisms are phenotypically recessive, look recessive. So in this case, we're looking at earlobes, where detached earlobes, free earlobes, are ultimately going to be the ones that are dominant. So if we notice that 9 out of 100 people have attached recessive earlobes, you need to realize that to get phenotypically recessive attached earlobes, you must be homozygous recessive. So 9 out of 100 is going to be 0 0.09. Remember, there needs to be a 0 there because it's less than 10. So 0 0.09 is going to be equal to not Q. I know when you see recessive, sometimes you want to say, oh, it's Q. But because it's the recessive phenotype, that means that this is referring to the genotype Q squared. These are people that have two Q alleles. So now that I know Q squared, I can then solve for Q. So I can say, well, Q would be the square root of 0 0.09. Now for me... When I'm giving you stuff, I'll always make sure they work out to be whole numbers. So I'm not going to give you something that's going to be an answer that's like 0.25984. In this case, you have to say, how do I get 9? What would I multiply? So ultimately, it's going to be 0 0.3. 0 0.3 times 0 0.3 is 0 0.09 because it's less than 10. So our answer is going to be 0 0.3 equals Q. Now that I know Q, I can say, well, I can figure out P. It has to be whatever is remaining to equal 1, so 0.7. Now that I know P and Q, I can solve for anything. So what do they want? They want homozygous dominant individuals. Homozygous dominant means P squared. So that means I just take P, which is 0.7, square it, and I get 0.49. So for that group of 100 people, I can expect that 49 of them out of the 100 would be homozygous dominant and have free earlobes. So this allows me to figure out information about frequencies of genotypes that I can't see. You know, I can't, I can't just count the number of individuals that are homozygous dominant because I can't see the difference between heterozygotes and homozygous dominants. Now for Hardy-Weinberg to last, for us to be at Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, where no evolution occurs, we need five characteristics to be present that won't be present in nature. So don't be just 
trying to figure out a way that this will work. This is not going to happen in nature. It's more of a thought exercise. And it's also highly useful because the next thing we're going to talk about is microevolution, which is going to be the opposite of all these. So if we want things to stay as stable as possible, a large population is going to help. Because the bigger the population, the less likely some freak chance accident is going to occur and make us lose an allele because the only person with that allele just died or didn't reproduce. We don't want any migration because when things come in or out, they can be the one person with an allele that leaves, so now it's gone, or they can bring in a brand new allele that our population didn't have before. That's going to be evolution. We can't have any genetic change in any frequency of any allele, which means no new alleles and no new genes either. We have to have no net mutations. I usually just say no mutations, but ultimately it is possible you can have mutations so long as somebody else has the opposite mutation. But in general, you want no mutations because they can lead to new alleles and they can lead in some cases to new genes. For mating, we can't have certain individuals be more likely to mate than others. So we really can't have any type of sexual selection. We can't have any way that one male or one female would be more fruitful than others. So we need random mating. Now, that's not saying this is going to happen, that you just kind of blindly walk around and eventually choose someone with no criteria. But this is what we need to happen, where each individual has an equal shot at reproduction. And lastly, we have no natural selection. And what this really is talking about is survival. We need it to be where it's essentially random survival. We don't want certain individuals to be more likely to survive, which will then allow them to be more likely to reproduce, which means that they pass on their genes more, so their genes and their particular alleles for those genes become more common, which is evolution. 